Okay, well, let me, um, let me begin by reading uh, the text. And really, the, the text that, that uh, Edward uses for the entirety of his religious affections uh, the print, to get the principle is verse 8, if I'm not mistaken. And what he sees here, and I'll just tell you briefly, is he, he sees Peter writing to a group of Christians that are going through a trial. And he realizes that trials are meant to refine and purify faith. And as that faith is purified, there's a couple of things that rise to the surface, and that is love and joy. And that love is really, the, the, as I said before, the, the, the fountain of all the affections, of all the religious affections, of, of what true Christianity is really all about. It's that life-transforming principle the Spirit of God places in our souls that inevitably overcomes our sins and makes us to, to become more like Jesus. So with that in mind, let me read this text. 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 1 through verse 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. <clears throat> well, may the Lord bless his, his word to our hearing this morning. Now, as I've already mentioned this evening, Dr. Godfrey is going to give us a very brief overview of the life and thought of Jonathan Edwards. And again, I'm going to challenge a few of the things that he has to say because. Um, you know, when we get when we get to it tonight, um, we'll we'll maybe see a little bit more. Not everybody can focus entirely on one person, you know, on on their lives. But there are people who do that, and the people who do that are going to know that person better than others who have to kind of study a, a large swath of uh, church history. So there may be a couple of things we might want to modify, but. As I considered how we might prepare for that lecture, and again, knowing he's going to touch on several of Edward's writings, I thought it would be best to introduce that most important work, the religious affections. You know, there's one other work that is considered to be perhaps his greatest, and it's kind of a toss-up between these two, but if you have to read one of the two, I recommend this one. The other one is The Freedom of the Will, and that is not an easy book to read. And really, it's meant to point out the freedom of the will um, that um, Calvinism or the God's sovereignty must, must be true. Okay? Uh, if we had time, and I'm going to explain this a little bit more at the end of the sermon, how Edwards approaches the subject, we'll, we'll see that what he was looking for, what he always is asking is, what is it that causes this to happen? Okay, and what we're looking at this morning is, what causes a Christian to behave the way that he does, or the way that he should. You know, what is it that made Jesus? What motivated him? Well, of course, it's a matter of the heart. Religious affections is really a series of sermons on the things that distinguish the work of the Holy Spirit, the saving work in the soul of a man. Now, this is important. I think this book is important. First of all, because it helps us to understand who Edwards is, okay? Uh, how he loved his Lord, why he loved his Lord. You know, we really only need to, to read his first resolution. Maybe you've heard of the resolutions of Jonathan Edwards. They're pretty serious 
resolutions. And um, as John Gerstner said, he actually kept those by God's grace throughout his life. But this was his first one. And it gives us a little bit of uh, understanding of how much Edwards really loved the Lord and desired to serve him. He says, resolve that I will do whatever I think to be most to the glory of God. Now, what follows, don't see this as being something else he does, but being the same thing. And my own good, profit, and pleasure. I mean, what is for his good and his profit and pleasure? But to glorify God. He says, to do this in the whole of my duration, not just while on earth, but also forever, without any consideration of the time, whether now or never so many myriads of ages hence, resolve to do what I think to be my duty and most for the good and advantage of mankind in general, resolve so to do whatever difficulties I meet with, how many soever and how great soever. I think what Edwards is saying here is that I'm resolved to love God with my, my whole heart, mind, soul, and strength and my neighbor as myself, you know, regardless of how difficult that's going to be. Now, the religious affections help, help us to understand Edwards, how somebody could write that, how somebody could feel that. Secondly, it helps us understand the Spirit's work, okay? Now, Edwards wrote this book as a response to the critics of the Great Awakening. And the Great Awakening is what we saw last week. There were those who were saying, thankfully not, not the majority of people, but a good, good amount of them, I think something like either 25 or 30 percent, who believed that the movement was nothing more than emotional enthusiasm. Okay? People were just getting worked up and emotional. It was really not a work of the Spirit of God. They believed that at best. At worst, they believed it was a work of the, of the devil. Now, Edwards points out that during revivals, both kingdoms are active. Christ, as Christ's kingdom moves forward with power and advances, the devil moves to resist it. So, uh, revival is always going to be a mixed bag. And the problem is the critics were looking at the things that the devil was doing and missing out what the Spirit of God was doing. Now, Edwards saw this fact as the reason why people fall away so quickly when a revival is, is over. He points to several examples in the Bible, like in the days of Josiah, there was this great revival, but very short after Josiah dies, they all fall away. Or John the Baptist, remember the, the splash he made on the scene as he's preaching and all Israel is coming out to him and how quickly they fell from him or the ministry of Christ himself and the apostles. It's because the devil is working also as the kingdom of God advances. He also sees that this is what's behind why the Roman Catholic Church stood so strongly against the gospel when it was proclaimed by Luther and Zwingli and Calvin. It's because, again, the devil was trying to keep them trapped in the system of works and to destroy their souls. And he would say this is why also there was so much opposition against the Great Awakening. So he believed it was important to recognize the Spirit's work so that readers, or his readers, could see that uh, the revival was his work so that his critics didn't end up committing the unpardonable sin. Now, um, Godfrey is going to make mention of that this evening uh, in a way that, that somewhat, I think, misrepresents what Edwards had in mind. He's not saying if you criticize the awakening, you're guilty of committing the unpardonable sin. He would say if you attribute what the Spirit of God is doing in this revival to the devil, then you're doing exactly what the Pharisees were doing when Jesus said that you're guilty of committing a sin that has no forgiveness. That's when you attribute to the devil the work of the Spirit. That's why Edwards said that. And he didn't say they were guilty of it, but he said they were getting precariously close to that. So he wanted to make sure they understood the Spirit of God was at work. And thirdly, he said, uh, or we should look at this book because it'll help us understand what is most important to us, and that is that the Spirit of God is working in us, right? Because that is how we know that our eternal well-being is secure. Now, Edwards writes this in his preface, there is no question of greater importance to mankind and that it more concerns every individual person to be well resolved in than this, 
what are the distinguishing qualifications of those that are in favor with God and entitled to his eternal rewards? Or which comes to the same thing, what is the nature of true religion? And wherein lie the distinguishing notes of that virtue and holiness that is acceptable in the sight of God? You know, he said the fact that there is, and he said this amazingly so, that there's so much disagreement on this is, is a reason why he had to write about it. He continues, but though it be of such importance, and though we have clear and abundant light in the Word of God to direct us in this matter, yet there is no one point wherein professing Christians do more differ one from another. It would be endless to reckon up the variety of opinions in this point, that divide the Christian world, making manifest the truth of that declaration of our Savior. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Now let me just mention that what Edwards writes will certainly be very convicting to us, but it will also point us in the right direction, okay, as we pursue the reason for which God saved us. And that is to glorify him by becoming more like his son. I mean, he really does have a purpose. You know, Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren who are like him. And we need to remember that work starts on earth. It's not completed on earth, thankfully. That's, I mean, it'd be nice if it were, but thankfully we know it isn't. And that explains part of the reason why we're, we're not as much like Christ as we'd like to be. But it does begin, and it does progress, and we do need to see it, okay, because this is the work of God's Spirit in us, and it will be in every true believer. So this morning, I just want us to consider a few things. The importance of the affections, or regarding the importance of them, that this is how God's grace is mainly seen in our lives. Not what we profess, but basically what we do. What, what affections actually are, that Christianity is all about holy affections, and that these affections will move us to pursue holiness. Okay, so first of all, God's grace in our lives is mainly revealed through the affections. And we see that in 1 Peter 1.8. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. You know, I heard John Gerster say on one occasion, every Christian should have love for God, but also joy. You know, we should have a joy in, in Christianity and in our relationship with the Lord and in just knowing that we know him in our glorious future, but, but joy in that relationship. And that, that's something that comes from this love as well, but something we don't want to miss here. Now, I've already told you in the context he's writing to believers who were going through a very difficult trial, perhaps multiple trials. He notes that God sends trials into our lives for three reasons, and I thought this would be helpful for, for all of us because we're all going through them, and some of us worse than others, or at least more fiery trials and others. The reason for trials are, are these, to show us that we have genuine faith, okay? To show us whether or not we're really trusting in the Lord because as our faith is tried, we continue to hold on to the Lord. Secondly, to show us how beautiful faith actually is, how it's more precious than gold. You know, you can, if you don't have faith, you'll perish in the end. Even though you had a world that was made of pure gold, it wouldn't be enough to buy your soul. It's much more precious than gold. And especially in the way it helps us to deal with the trials we go through. And then he said, thirdly, its purpose is to purify and strengthen that faith. As we know, it burns off the dross of unbelief. It makes our faith stronger and more active and so more easier, or I should say, easier to see. Now, Peter says that these trials showed two things about his readers. First of all, that they love Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Edwards asked, why would they be willing to endure these things for Christ if they didn't love him? Even though they couldn't see their Lord, 
God had given them such a love in their hearts that made them hold on to Jesus no matter what they had to face. And secondly, they could do that with joy. And though you do not see him now but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. They had a joy that was greater than their trial, that enabled them willingly to face that suffering. He says, a powerful joy that is inexpressible and full of glory, so much stronger than anything that the world had to offer. He would say, a sanctifying joy, a foretaste <clears throat> of what they would receive in heaven. So as their trials refined and purified their faith, the, the nature of this grace in their hearts was more clearly revealed in a love and joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, that, that is essentially the, the answer to the, uh, the first question here is that God's grace in our lives is revealed mainly through affections. Trials are meant to strengthen faith or that grace in us, and when it's strengthened, it reveals itself in affections. Now, secondly, let's consider what Edwards means by affections. He writes this, and this is really key. The affections are no other than the, the more vigorous and sensible exercises of the inclination and will of the soul. Okay, and inclination and will, well, he's going to unpack that here in just a moment. But inclination is what is it, what is it that I incline towards? What is it I like? What is it that I want? And will, what is it that I choose? Okay, the affections are the more vigorous and sensible exercises of that inclination and that makes me choose the things that I choose. <coughs> Excuse me. I need another sip here. All right, so he says that God has given to us in our souls two different faculties, two different abilities. First of all, he gives us understanding, the ability to gather information, to gather facts, to think about them from differing angles, to group similar ideas together and to distinguish other ideas, to build theories and to draw conclusions. Okay, that's what he calls uh, the understanding. But the second is that faculty, he says, by which we are either pleased with something and so inclined towards it or are displeased with it and so disinclined towards it or reject it. Now, he says, with regard to our choices, this faculty is called the will. What do I will? I will what, what it is I am inclined towards. With regard to our inclinations, he says it's called the heart. So in other words, the heart and the will are the same in, in the view of Edwards. Now he says all of these inclinations or the things that our heart desires can either be strong or weak. When they're strong, we call them affections. And he would say we always choose, we always will to do according to the strongest of those affections. Whatever we want the most, that's what we're going to choose. Now, that's what affections are. Now, let me just say something as a side note. Edwards argues that, again, affections are not a part of our bodies. They are a part of our souls, even though God has put our souls and our bodies together in such a way that what affects one will affect the other. He'd say, for instance, when we're afraid, we might feel our gut wrench, or we might ha our knees might knock together. If we're sick or we get run down, we might become depressed. But he would say only our souls can think about things. Only our souls can be pleased or displeased with the things that we think about, which means that these affections are in the soul and not in the body. And that's important because that means that when our souls are eventually separated from our bodies, which they will be at death in the intermediate state, we will still have our affections, okay? We will still be able to think and we will still be able to love and to choose and to will to give glory to God. We will still love Him. 
Okay, so affections, again, are those strong inclinations. Now, third, a saving relationship with Christ, he would say, is all about holy affections. Edwards writes this, that religion which God requires and will accept does not consist in weak, dull, and lifeless wishes, raising us but a little above a state of indifference. God in his word greatly insists upon it that we be good in earnest, fervent in spirit, and our hearts vigorously engaged in religion. Now, he gives us numerous passages, numerous examples, but consider, he said, the following commandments we have in Scripture. First of all, Paul writes this in Romans 12, verses 10 and 11. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Moses writes to the children of Israel, and again, this is a commandment which we know equally applies to us because Jesus uses this in, when he's asked what the greatest commandment is. Deuteronomy 10, 12. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and he said something very similar in the passage we read earlier in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now, Edwards argues that that is what the circumcision of the heart by the Holy Spirit or the new birth that he brings, okay, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again. That is what it creates. Okay? In Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, where Moses is actually looking forward to the blessings of the new covenant, he writes this, Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. The circumcision of the heart is the same thing as the work of regeneration, that washing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit, as it's referred to in the New Testament. And what it brings is this love for God and a love, of course, for our neighbor. And that's what the new covenant is all about, where the Spirit of God writes the law upon our hearts. He points out that Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds, as Paul writes to Titus in Titus 2.14. Edwards writes, the things of religion are so great that there can be no suitableness in the exercises of our hearts to their nature and importance unless they be lively and powerful. In nothing is vigor in the actings of our inclination so requisite as in religion, and in nothing is lukewarmness so odious. Now, I couldn't help but see in that particular statement, that especially that last part, what Jesus was referring to in Revelation 3, verses 15 and 16, where he says to the church, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, we're not used to hearing Jesus say words like that. But the word spit there literally means I will vomit you out of my mouth. You make me sick is what he's saying. And what Edwards is saying is the things of religion are so great and so glorious that to respond in this way to them is, is to displease, to say it mildly, uh, our Lord. Paul writes to, to Timothy that there are those who hold to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. He says the Spirit to Timothy gives power and love and a sound mind. John the Baptist said about Christ that when he would come, that he would baptize with the Spirit and with fire. Now, I know a lot of people see that as two different things, you know, he's going to give his people his spirit, and he's going to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. But I think what John the Baptist was meant here was that he would give us the spirit who would give us fire for him. He's the one who makes our hearts burn within us as he did Jesus' disciples in his conversation 
to two of them on the road to Emmaus. <clears throat> Edwards points out the Christian life is often compared in Scripture to things that require all of our strength, all of our effort, to competitions such as running, wrestling, agonizing for a prize or a crown, to <clears throat> fighting with enemies who are trying to destroy us, or as warfare where the violent seek to take a city or a kingdom by force. Now, Edwards writes this, And though true grace has various degrees, and there are some that are but babes in Christ, in whom the exercise of the inclination of the will towards divine and heavenly things is comparatively weak, yet everyone that has the power of godliness in his heart has his inclinations and heart exercised toward God and divine things with such strength and vigor that these holy exercises do prevail in him above all carnal or natural affections and are effectual to overcome them. For every true disciple of Christ loves him above father or mother, wife and children, brethren and sisters, houses and lands, yea, his own life. From hence it follows that wherever true religion is, there are vigorous exercises of the inclination and will towards divine objects. But by what was said before, the vigorous, lively, and sensible exercises of the will are no other than the affections of the soul. See, I told you this is extremely challenging, isn't it? Because it really re rebukes our, our struggles even to do the most basic things with regard to worshiping Christ, serving Christ, honoring Him. Our whole lives are to be given to Him with all the strength that we have to give. Now, that's why he says that faith in Christ is more than simply a belief in the facts. That's something we talk about all the time. If we have this affection for Him, it will move us to serve Him. Edwards writes this, it is affection that engages the covetous man and him that is greedy of worldly profits in his pursuits. And it is by the affections that the ambitious man is put forward in pursuit of worldly glory. And it is the affections also that actuate the voluptuous man in his pursuit of pleasure and sensual delights. The world continues from age to age in a continual commotion and agitation in a pursuit of these things but take away all affection, and the spring of all this motion would be gone, and the motion itself would cease. And as in worldly things, worldly affections are very much the spring of men's motion and action, so in religious matters, the spring of their actions is very much religious affection. He that has doctrinal knowledge and speculation only without affection never is engaged in the business of religion. I think that really reproves the reform camp. You know, we spend all our time studying the Bible and learning reform doctrine. And it's important that we learn it. Edwards is not saying that we shouldn't learn. But if that's as far as it goes, we haven't really gone to square one yet, which is that we need to serve the Lord. Okay, we have to have more than doctrinal knowledge and speculation. We need love, okay? We need affection for the Lord. We will only do as much as our affection will move us. Now, let me close with this last quote by Edwards. There are, there are many that often hear of the glorious perfections of God, His almighty power and boundless wisdom, His infinite majesty and that holiness of God by which He is of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on iniquity and the heavens are not pure in his sight, and of God's infinite goodness and mercy, and hear of the great works of God's wisdom, power, and goodness, wherein there appear the admirable manifestations of these perfections. They hear particularly of the unspeakable love of God in Christ, and of the great things that Christ has done and suffered, and of the great things of another world, of eternal misery and bearing the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God and of endless blessedness and glory in the presence of God, and the enjoyment of His dear love. They also hear the preemptory commands of God, and His gracious counsels and warnings, and the sweet invitations of the gospel. I say, 
They often hear these things and yet remain as they were before with no sensible alteration in them either in heart or practice because they are not affected with what they hear. I am bold to assert that there was never any considerable change wrought in the mind or conversation of any person by anything of a religious nature that he ever read, heard, or saw that had not his affections moved. Never was a natural man engaged earnestly to seek his salvation. Never were any such brought to cry after wisdom and lift up their voice for understanding and to wrestle with God in prayer for mercy. And never was one humbled and brought to the foot of God from anything that ever he heard or imagined of his own unworthiness and deserving of God's displeasure. Nor was ever one induced to fly for refuge unto Christ while his heart remained unaffected. Nor was there ever a saint awakened out of a cold, lifeless flame. By the way, that can happen. And it's good to know, isn't it? You know, that even saints can grow cold, but that shouldn't be the way we live, okay? Nor was there ever a saint awakened out of a cold, lifeless flame or recovered from a declining state in religion and brought back from a lamentable departure from God without having his heart affected. And here's the conclusion. And in a word, there never was anything considerable brought to pass in the heart or life of any man living by the things of religion that had not his heart deeply affected by those things. Okay, do you see the point of Edwards? Is that our hearts must be moved. You know, we must have these desires, these strong affections, if we are going to choose the things we, we should choose. And if we're not choosing them, it means that we're not affected by them. Our affections are not strong enough. By the way, reading this kind of stuff can really get you... We kind of wake you up, can't it? Kind of get you fired up. Okay, so let me just draw this to a conclusion. I told you that Edwards has been called the, the theologian of causality. That's, that's what uh, the uh, freedom of the will is all about. You know, it, he doesn't just go through the scriptures and say, you know, the Bible says we, just, we don't have the ability to choose good and evil without the grace of God. But what he would say is that every choice that we make ever is always has a reason behind it. There's always a cause. And he begins to you know, search out those causes. And if all of our affections are only corrupt and those are the causes, then the choices we make are only going to be of one kind. So anyway, he, he just looks at what's behind, what's going on. That's why when John Gerstner wrote his... Uh, Systematic theology of Jonathan Edwards, he called it the rational biblical theology of Edwards. He didn't just call it the biblical theology because Edwards is the theologian of causality and that really does have to do with reason. You know, he, he uses reason as well as scripture, but he reasons within the bounds of scripture. And here in this book, he is looking for the cause of our actions. Well, that cause is our affections. And if we want to do more for the Lord, this is what must be strengthened. Our hearts need to be moved more by God's Holy Spirit. And if that's what we want, okay, we need to spend more time with, with God and less with the other things that tend to draw our hearts away from Him. Now, listen to what Jesus says in this closing remark. You'll recognize it, but it, it applies very, very well here. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, verse 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Then he makes an application. You can't serve God and mammon, okay? So what Jesus is telling us here is that if God is to be first in our affections, then he must be master. He must be Lord. We must, he must be first in our lives. If we divide our lives up into these different compartments where we have all these things on a par with God, that's going to weaken our love for God and we're not going to do really what we should be doing. But if we put God first and we do everything we do out of love for him, then we'll be doing everything we're supposed to be doing in these other relationships that we have, but we'll be doing it for, out of love for God and not just because 
We just simply love them. It's not that we're not supposed to love them, but remember what Jesus said? We need to, by comparison, hate them. You know, um, with, you know, as we compare that with our love for God, our love for God needs to be so much greater. So the point is, we need to love Him more. And there's no, there's no way that we can do that except by having communion with Him. And He's given us a variety of ways to do that, but here's the other thing. We need to be communing with Him all the time, don't we? We need to be walking with Him all the time through life, always guided by His Spirit and His Word, always doing the things we do out of love for Him and not neglecting anything that He's called us to do. Remember, Christianity is not just not doing the things He says don't do, you know, but it's doing the things He says also to do. Those are the things that are the harder things to do. But that is what the affections will move us to do, is to obey Him in, in every area. So let's purpose from this to spend more time with the Lord and put Him first in our lives that we might see what it is being formed in our lives, Christ being formed in our lives. Let me ask you, is that the way Jesus was? It certainly was. So if we want to become more like Him, that's the kind of heart we need. Well, may the Lord grant us that mercy. Let's, uh, let's bow in a moment, a few moments of prayer as we prepare to come to the Lord's table.